you either got the person who sold the house and their subsequent families who then have to move, but they've been paid money. The second one is it's been if you're a tenant in a house, it's been sold, and now you need to relocate. Um, the third one is <laughs> similar situation, it's a block of flats or something, the landlord is upgrading and you can't afford the new rent in item or, or in example B, you're in effect being asked to move because something else is coming there. In option C, the redevelopment is causing, you can be there, but it's causing a substantial rental increase, which prices you out the market space. Um, all the examples we've encountered thus far. Private property. And it's it's caused the problem because it's caused the backlash to the city. Um, maybe at some point we should have been a bit quieter. Um, sometimes no good deed goes unpunished. Um, in certain cases it's been a completely private matter. Well, in, in Eviction orders have been granted, and generally speaking, we've also seen from the tenant side they have not been completely blameless. Um, we have seen multiple instances where the backlog in terms of rental non-payment has been huge. Um, no maintenance is happening into buildings. You know, and, and there are two sides of the coin. Then. If you're going to be a tenant, you also need to be a good tenant. You need to, you know, look after the place you stay. Quite often that doesn't happen. Um, to be able to maintain it and for the person who owns it to make money, they, you need to pay rent. And, and look after the business property. So that has been maybe a push factor, but the strongest pull factor is is the attraction of economic benefit because of the willingness and wantingness to be in the city. This relocation of people due to economic cost is not localized to the low end, low rate pay or low rent paying, non rent paying in some case people. I've also seen it in the more in the more middle class segments or the or the better off segments where for example I mentioned um, an apartment block gets upgraded. The person has been paying six, seven, eight thousand rand a month. An upgrade comes in. That apartment after they've spent money on it now attracts a rental of of 10, 15,000 rand a month. The person who could afford eight can't afford 15. So, A, they start to find other premises in the city, which costs, well, 8,000 rand, but maybe they're paying 8,000 rand for what was the 6,000 rand rental before, puts rental pressure on it. <coughs> So we get rental creep. Um, there's a contentious one which is adding to it. The contentious, the contentious one which adds to that to that pressure now is at a rental level, which is quite often where the gentrification is felt. It is felt at the ownership level as well because property prices increase, but that's just across the board. But is there's been a paradigm shift in the rental space. So insofar as Uber brought a paradigm shift to the taxi market. Um, what are they called now? Airbnb. Of course the paradigm shift in the rental space. Do yourself a favor, go up to Airbnb. Go to the website, click on Cape Town, and it will show you the number of listed properties. Now, initially, it 
was a co-sharing type of thing. You've got a house, you've got a free couch with free room, you can make some extra money, you rent it out. Then what would happen is people live in an apartment, they're going on holiday for three months, or they're moving to Joburg for work for six months or a year, as opposed to doing a short-term rental, Airbnb. People have now purchased property, not to gain rental income, because, because the Airbnb rentals are substantially higher. You're, you're competing with the hotel industry and the bed and breakfast and guest house industry as opposed to rentals. That attracts a daily or weekly rate as opposed to a monthly. So on Airbnb you could get double or triple the monthly rental than you would with a normal tenant. Um, but it's also affected where people have bought entire houses yeah. and are turning it into Airbnb style guest houses. So it does a few things. Houses in desirable spots are being purchased by people wanting to do this, so it drives the price. One. B. People who own property for investment purposes who buy a flat or a block of flats, but you need a flat, maybe even a house. Where in previous years, they would have put it on the rental market for rental income and it would have added to the rental pool. Now, a good number of them are deciding to put it on Airbnb, and this is largely inbound tourists who are taking up the spots. A, it's taking the stock, it's taking the rental stock off the market. So when you take the rental stock off the market, well, the same amount of people looking for spots, less stock. Um, elasticity of, dem um, of demand, the price goes up. So when but you're getting young professionals coming into the city. Uh, you graduated you three years into your new job as an accountant, you're earning money. You're trying to live in town. And you're earning well. You're just, you're just about qualifying as a chartered accountant. You've done your GDI and your articles. <coughs> you're probably earning, I don't know, 30,000 rand a month, 30,000 a month. You should be able to, there should be no problem. Maybe you're even coupled, you know, so the two of you, you, you should live a good lifestyle. And you're struggling to rent in town because it's just, it's the pricing. It's been pushed by all these factors. So, um, what you've got there is, and also in some cases, whole houses have been turned into this. People are guest houses. Cape is becoming a tourist destination, and the market is gearing for it. And unfortunately, the Atlantic seaboard and the central city is a desirable place to be. Not because they want to be in the city for work, but, but although that, that doesn't happen because we have some business tourists coming, not tourists, but you coming in for three weeks business work as opposed to staying in a hotel, you stay in Airbnb. It's cheaper. But people coming into Canton as tourists want to be in close. There's the waterfront, there's Table Mountain, they want to, there's the long street, Cliff Street, Camps Bay side. They want to be close to it. So that drives the inner city and it's affecting everybody across the board. It pushes the price up. So it affects those people who live here. If you own a house in an apartment, it affects you. Because your property value increases. People always say, if your property value increases, it's great, you know, you benefit. You know, if you plan to live in the house, if you plan to sell it in three years' time, great. In three years' time, you're going to make more money. Assuming you're trying not to buy somewhere else in the CBD, because then you're just stuck. Because <coughs> if you sell, you have to buy, so that you don't make money, you're spending so much. You only really benefit if you're going to sell up here and move to Lanabar or to Darling or wherever it is you want to move to, then you benefit. But if you're planning to live here for 10 years, when your property value increases, the only, the only effect is that your rates increase.
Um, and we've seen it. Um, part of part of the missed portion of the gentrification side is those people who are working who can't afford. But I also deal with pensioners who live in Rangiza. Very nice place to live, isn't it? Well, they bought the house in 1960 for 30,000 rand. They're now in their 70s, maybe. Their pensions, they saved a bit of money, they did okay. And suddenly the house is worth 5 million rand. And every year increases by 15%. And they say, look here, inflation is only 4%, 5%. So we're expecting a 5% rates increase. They've worked their life, they've budgeted, they've planned hard. They're not spectacularly rich. The only value they have is in the property. But the only way to extract it is to sell. They've lived here for 50, 60 years. That, that's the effect. Price escalations. So I've been looking, there are policies which we have run where if people are pensioners under a certain threshold, which is not spectacularly high, but still it's just some help to them. And those, so in the city, if you're a pensioner based household, with household income, gross income, is under 15,000 rand, you, form, you, you qualify for some form of slide and scale rebate on your rates. So 15,000 rand you earn. Largely people have sold up family owned housing for a big price and they've moved out. In other cases, some local families have owned another property and a, a local has lived there on, on the rental and somebody's offered in, um, I'm trying to think now, but in one of the more prominent streets, Rose Street's been taken hit because it's very touristy and it's desirable to be in a business sense. And somebody comes in and offers, I don't know, six, eight million rand for the house. So it gets sold. And somebody phoned me and said, they, they, they have to move. I asked for the community to help me find a spot for this woman. I think she must be paying three, four thousand a month. Somebody across the road said, you, you can rent the place I'm in. It's twenty four thousand a month. This is one of the issues yeah. which we deal with in terms of social housing perspectively around the area. Um, and they've been talking about it for a while. And I say, become serious, become a proper company. There was an issue a while ago when the city auctioned the plot. So it was reposted again. The yard was about 120 square meters. So, yeah, so single residential. Um, we would normally have gone to close the on that previously. But the city's trying to maximize property assets. And that was one of the first trial runs where they said, look, yeah, this is prospectively got value based on where it is. There's not much you can do with it. It's, you can build a single residential unit. You cannot build other stuff. It needs to be rezoned. It won't fit into that footprint. Um, you can't build a townhouse, you can't build an apartment block on that single residential. Let's see if you can maximize the revenue of it. When the auction went for 1.4, 1.6, immediately went back on the market for about 3 million. Public auction, you could have bid. Um, a local grouping did try to engage with the city to say, look, we'd like to develop it. But there'd been discussions earlier, nothing came to it. And then they requested right before the auction went up to sell us the property for a fraction of what the city got for the auction. And we will do a development. I mean, like, it's single residential now. Not necessarily always represent at a view level everybody, but it is the single largest existing body and structured body and I do engage with it often and and we discuss and we dialogue regarding the issue of that specific property. It was caught up in a process, it's 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 
the city cannot just hand out cash. Um, we are bound by legislation. You know, we kind of fall afoul, not fall afoul, but we're bound by um, uh, uh, the Municipal Finance Management Act, the Municipal Asset Transfer Act, all those things come to We cannot, I can't just give you that. Yeah. It can't happen. Right. Right? As much as I'm aware. You had the money, and somebody offers you 5 million rand. Hey, I mm, take the 5 million rand, take 2 million rand, 1 million rand, buy a house in Goodwood. Do it up. Publish your uncle, two million rand in the bank. Pay for my kids, vast fees, whatever it is that you want to do. But yes, there's the cultural aspect to it. Um, in terms of those moving into work, two levels, two types. There are very few people who are returning to Boca, meaning they come from Boca, the families to live in, and they move back. Very, very few of that because of the pricing. So what you're getting is you're getting local South Africans. Because within the inner CBD a couple of years ago, Boca was substantially cheaper than everywhere else. So if I wanted to move into the city and I had three million rand to spend, what I could buy in Fedok for that wasn't much, but what I could buy in Burka for that was substantially more. So I was buying in Burka. So locals were coming in. We also had a lot of foreigners. A fair amount of foreigners were coming in for property. A for the pricing and B they like the cultural interaction. It's a, it's, it's a very nice place to be. It's a very friendly place to be. The friendliest portion of the actual CBD because it's, a, it's very close living. And the community is, is the culture of trust and the, the Muslim base is a family base they've got there. So we've had a fair amount of foreigners, Germans, Italians, French and moved in and live there. Live there and all run their stars. Then the third side is businesses have moved in. And this is why the problem is we're getting business encroachment. Now, part of the gentrification of the is the loss of space and people. It's unfortunate it happens, but what concerns me as much is the fact that as this happened, a place like the World Cup will slowly start to erode its culture through gentrification. It's the very reason you wanted to be there in the first place, is for this exciting culture that you there, and then you come in and change it. So I'm very protective there. Um, a lot of those, should we call them, outsiders, customer parties who move into work up to stay, to live there, have come there because they like the culture and they've embraced it and been accepted into it. So they don't represent the cultural threat. They may represent the money threat in terms of the purchase of power and they've been embraced by the locals as well. And you're in the fast lane right about you, you would have seen it when there have been an interaction. But when you have businesses moving offices in with staff who are occupying the street with parking and don't interact, that's a threat because that's when you roll the culture. So that's something I'm countering quite heavily and focusing very strongly on on what is the zoning and are you allowed to do this. If people try their luck and base businesses in residential areas. It's ultimately a gentrification. It's businessification if you want to call it that. But it's bringing business into residential areas which shouldn't happen. In this area here, it got nipped in the bud a few years ago where some businesses moved out because the city was starting to enforce. We're not chasing it. We're, you're entitled to run a home office. You know, you're a little attorney, you've got your secretary working, it's fine. You can't have 10 staff members working in the house. I think it's a limited of four or five people who can work from the house, for example. Um, so that's the one side. Then, but my interaction will work up. No, let me get back to the solution I've got. The solution I'm working on specifically there to counter it. Let's look at the space. The properties that have been run the city. We've had the whole Duffelberg, Prince Child argument going on forever. 
heart in sin. Rightly or wrongly, I can't speak for it. It's it's provincial property. Um, I know what they did. The National told them we're not going to give you any more money, fine money. So they decided to sell property they owned. Because what you're looking at is, it's not the gap market. That wasn't gap. That was your anything calling for low-cost rental stock. Now, as opposed to the province making the 135 million rand that it needs to support operations based on the cut national funding, hey, we must not sell it, and now we must build there for, I don't know, maybe a billion, maybe we don't have. I'm not going to get into the argument that they must go to court with their fight. However, I've got very specific views. Do we need to provide for this affordable housing term is a misnomer? Because exactly, what is affordable housing? Is it an RTP house? Right? Is it, it, is it low income housing? Is it affordable housing? Is it gap housing? Is it high density housing? The jury's out. It's, it's huge. We need to understand what the need is, from my view. I approach it from a need point of view. The people of Woodstock and Surrounds. There's a historical basis you've got for being there. But you have lived there for 60 years. Yeah, they didn't think amongst the family of 10 people to buy the house. You could have, there, respectively, have bought that semi UN and a lot of people from his ad over the years, we could have bought it 30 years ago. 30 years ago, 10,000 rand. Right? What we And if we look at it now, we've got people who have lived here for six years and like, yes, we have. But you always rented, and hey, by the way, you haven't, between 10 of you, you haven't paid rent in five years. Hey, come on, for 10 years, on private property, you're not being fair. You know, if you're going to do this, I'm, I'm all for your historical wants and needs. I can understand your affinity. Is it like this one more? If you qualify in the indigent framework, as we spoke about earlier, right, under 6,000 pounds, awesome. there's a fair chance you're not employed, you're probably a pensioner, or you're not structurally employed. Maybe a part-time thing, but you're not in a job. You're probably not working in the CBD, right? Trust me, living in the CBD is expensive. Forget your rental, it's the cost. My wife was working at the Mrs. Plain. She would go shopping at town centre there. She wouldn't go shopping here. Because the stuff there's half the cost of here. It's expensive. Try it. You know? Go, go do shopping. Go do your shopping in Ballard, at Atlone, as opposed to here. Yeah. It's easy. Go look at the pricing at the waterfront versus other places. It's chalk and cheese. It's expensive being here. So, outside of, cost, outside of just the rental base, living in the city is expensive. And, um, the saving by being here is transport cost. You don't have to commute, but time wise. But it's expensive. So, you need to understand what the need is. Somebody who's living off a social grant, meaning you earn a, a single pension. There are people who own property who live in a pension, but if, but if you are living on a state pension, even on a private pension, because anybody with a private pension, which may have been fine 10 years ago, is not fine now based on rental prices, you can't afford to rent in the city. And why would you waste your pension? There's no compelling reason if you're not working here to be here, outside of other uh, 
live with play. But if if you're living on a child ground or a, or a, there's no compelling reason for you to be even close to the CBD. If, if I was living off a, a 6,000 rand pension, 4,000 pension, I mean, do, how do we go live in Wellington or something? I go there. Do, do, do you know what my money would get me? There is no compelling reason for me to be in the inner city bowl area of prison. There's a historical cultural aspect to it. It's the tie which makes people want to be in Woodstock. It, it's what's happening in Worker. It's a community that exists there and you want to be in it. But historically there. So you need to be here because you need to be here for work. I want a party in Long Street or in Cliff Street. Therefore, I'm 24 years old, recent graduate, I'm making some cash. I can live in a 50 square meter apartment. I can spend 10,000 a month on it because I can afford to. That's one. The other side is it's convenient because I work in the CBD, or I work close, and I make sense. So we need to understand the compelling reason for people to be here. Therefore, work level play. Live, level play is an option. You, you can choose where you want to live and go to gym. You can choose whether you want to play in First Street or whether you want to play in Edward Street in Belleville or whether you want to play in Fort Ricker Road in Paro. That's a choice. Work it tends to be less of a choice. Right? I work there. I'm not just going to change jobs. But it, you then look at the demographic of people across the spectrum who are employed in time. So you can have millionaire business owners, owners, whatever, or CEO of a large company based in town, all the way down to the cleaning staff, working in the building. You then look at the salary scalings of what prospectively those, those earnings may be. And I'm hoping to not touch on the people who get exploited, because there are people who probably get exploited at a labor level, where they're going to be earning two and a half thousand, three thousand a month. That's not a viable income. Even on a dual family income there, that's going to put you on a maximum of 7,000 a month. You cannot live on 7,000 a month in the CBD. You can't. Just that cost, transport, just as I said, the, the shock cost of living. The shock cost of living. There, there isn't a cash and carry in the central city where you can bulk up, for example. Um, it, it's expensive, so you probably can't. So we need to understand what is that entry level point. So I think, in my view, the, what we need with is gap house. The gap is back above. Mm -hmm. Above that pension threshold, above the really not. Um, but the gap is substantially higher here than what I think national government qualified for. Uh, clerical staff. Mm, at a family level, probably earn a decent amount of money, but they're not earning 30, 40, 50,000 men a month household income. They can afford to live in the city. They can afford to live closer to the city. They prospectively save huge hours in travel daily. Specifically, they've got parents living close. And where would it put them? And I'm kind of thinking to myself, you're probably operating a rental, a rental space between about three and a half to five, maybe six thousand a month. That's what I'm personally, my personal view on it, looking at it, is the gap. You would have been able to do that ten years ago. You can't anymore. You probably cannot find a place to rent 
in the city ball precinct. Find it 10,000 a month. At 10,000 a month, you're in a 50 square meter bachelor apartment. Not a family school. That's the gap. There. So, at that type of rental, it means you're probably needing a family income of at least 10 to 12,000 a month. Look, I mean, we say under 50,000 rent as a pensioner, you qualify for a rebate. Those numbers weren't just sucked out somewhere. So, if you're a viable family, it's paying 4,000 a month. If you have 12,000 rent income, you're paying a third. Which is probably not too far off where people quite often are bond paying. Right? They're only paying about a third of their family income into bonds, specifically early on. You step up over time as you go. The price stays the same, income increases as it comes to So, that's probably the starting point. The top end of that is probably early 20s. Think about it, even CBD. It's a. You're a policeman at an entry level, you're going to earn 10, 12,000 a month. Let's say your wife is a nurse or a clerical worker for a company. Let's say um, 8,000 a month. Well, let's not be six, we can turn that around. Your wife earns 12 and you earn the 8, it doesn't matter. You're talking about 20 odd. That still puts you in that space. If you're a four person family and you want to do well by your kids and want to put them in decent schools and pay fees and do those things, under 20,000 a month, you need gap housing. After about maybe 24, you're in the formal market space. You can, uh, you can maybe. Rent a house in Antwerp, or rent a house in Pinehurst, or rent an apartment there for six, seven thousand rand a month, maybe a bit more. Go live in Plumstead, find a nice place in Grossy Park, travels not too bad. But that appears to be where the gap is. Oh. And that's where you focus on. So the question is where? Now, I've dealt with people who have been looking for space. We've been trying to deal with some people who need to go into formal housing, possible rental stuff, tenancy issues, people who do need to be moved, or offered something. There are four specific people I'm dealing with. The city has got them. Nothing. We were looking in close to the CBD. It's, it's a simple type of thing. We said, okay, fine. It's we were a bit more responsible than with the drummer. Drummer, we're not responsible. We're not a responsible party. We just happen to be next to the one who opened our mouth and now we're in trouble. What do we do? And it's only four, so it's not a big number. I've tried. Well, the development out in Pelican Park, which was a bowl to own, was full. Nothing. Nothing. There is nothing in close. There is absolutely nothing. I then tried to sort one person out. I called in province, provincial housing. You guys, I won. I did need one. If I draw an 8k radius from here, run anything, nothing. There is no stop. It is occupied. So I see now again in the week, or well now, yesterday news, Albert Road. There's a king's up for the city needs to put us. Where are we going to put you? There's a development coming up which is focusing on mixed use gap housing. There's one coming up in Woodstock, there are a few spaces we've identified. But I don't even think they've broken ground yet. If we haven't broken ground, 
Unfortunately, when you do things through a governmental institution, be it the city or the province or national, it doesn't happen. We're not a private company that gets a plan now and it's built in six months' time. It doesn't happen. It, it's frustrating. We're dealing with altruistic reasons. What does frustrate me, though, is we are huge tracts of land which we can't touch. We have had this big debate. Um, uh, reclaim the city, carrying on about sea point. Right? Okay. How big was that site? Two hectares, maybe? One and a half hectares? It wasn't that big. The site is old school. Called two hectares. Okay.